we are out here at Red October 2021, back with Scott Ricard of the Heavy Hitters from Battlefield Las Vegas, and we are going to talk about the T-62 that they restored. Yeah, it's so great to are. have you back, man. Thank you. This is our latest restoration. This tank is probably our second most significant historical artifact uh, to that Iwo Jima Sherman. This tank is special because currently it is the largest firing tank in private hands. It's also the first time and the only time somebody has successfully developed a load for a smoothbore gun. So what caliber is this actually? So this is a 115 millimeter smoothbore. It's a multiple types of rounds, but this projectile you see here is a fin stabilized. It's, it's a high velocity, big punch. So it's, it's fin stabilized. Is it like our modern day Sabo round? This is uh, like a standard HE, okay. but it does have a discarding Sabo. One thing I should add is that this tank is the world's first smoothbore tank to ever be put into production. All of the modern tanks now are using smoothbore technology and this thing, I mean, was put into production in what, the, the 1960s? Yeah, I mean, it was actually developed during the early 60s. This tank in particular is in 1972. So this tank is not too different from its predecessor, the T-55. And a lot of the tank guys know the T-54, T-55 is the most mass produced tank in history. Freaking everywhere. <laughs> the concept of this tank, uh, the hull, it's almost the same with some subtle differences. The big difference about T-62 is the gun. When the Western countries came up with the 105 millimeter L7, at that time, it was the most formidable tank gun on the battlefield. And this gave the Soviets a reason to essentially kick the tank race off and keep it going. This tank was put into production pretty quickly because at that time, the Russians were designing the T-64, which came after this tank, but the design concept from the T-64 existed before this. It's such a complex tank, they needed like a stopgap tank to get something on the battlefield to counter that L7 gun. So this was the answer to it. You have to remember it's now a time of post uh, World War II. There was somewhat of a belief that rocket technology might be the answer in tanks. The ultimate answer was they discovered the smoothball gun. One of the advantages that smoothball provides is um, when the tank round fires, even in a rifle tank, the highest pressure spike is in that first foot to half and a foot within the chamber and then it begins to, the pressure begins to drop down and then the round is propelled out. But right. because um, in that initial pressure spike, the driving bands have to cut into the rifling and overcome the rifling grooves. If you eliminate the rifling grooves, you can create a much higher pressure spike. That is how they increase the velocity of the smoothbore gun. And then with that increased velocity brings longer range. The challenge is, uh, because the rifling is now eliminated and that round is not spinning anymore when it leaves the barrel That's where the fin stabilized aspect of it uh, comes into play okay, that makes For you sense as a tank commander or your background in tanks if that makes sense to you on Yeah, that way. absolutely makes sense in order to stabilize the projectile You've got to add fins to the cartridge in order to get it to spin and stabilize in air it's just like throwing a football at that point so this round looks monstrous it a lot of people glance at this and they think that thing must be uh just a massive boom but in actual fact uh this reduced neck here the projectile actually drops all the way down and this next section of the round is actually to hold the fins so your powder wow. level is still down the bottom here it's interesting to see you know where our 120 millimeter gun comes from these days as well. Looking at all of this casing that has to eject out the back of the hatch, instead these days it all disintegrates in the bore. Yeah, if you go back to T55, uh, 100 millimeter rifle, upon ejection those cartridges either fell on the floor of the tank and the loader had to either manually throw them out the hatch or put them back into their stowage spot. Cartridges this big actually uh, accumulating on the turret floor is quite a bit of an issue because uh, let's say you're in the heat of the moment in battle and uh, you've got some rapid fire going on and these things are piling up on the floor of the turret and you go into a traverse there is a chance 
that these cartridges will actually jam and bind oh. and potentially lock up the turret. Yeah. Or you have other issues such as the cartridge might whip around and catch electrical leads, things of that yeah. nature. This tank actually has an auto eject feature where the round ejects into a tray and then simultaneously a tray lifts and the back door on the turret opens and it ejects the round out of the tank automatically. That's a cool way to, to fix that. It's, it's like an ejection port on a handgun, right? Right. Like, it's gonna send it right out the back. It, it, it really does. It throws it beyond the back of the tank, way out. Okay. Uh, but given uh, in our situation, uh, these shells are at least $800 a piece. So Ouch. we're not really in a position to be launching them out of the back of the turret <laughs> across the desert. As cool but, as that would be to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we talked about the unique nature of the development of the tank. Can you tell me some of the unique details about this particular vehicle? Yeah, of course. So uh, the way you see this tank right now is as it was. Uh, it, it was delivered from Russia to Syria right before the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Really briefly, the Yom Kippur War, Yom Kippur is a Jewish holiday, and much like the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, the uh, Syrians and the Egyptians took advantage of the fact that the Israelis were going to lessen their strength on their defensive lines for that holiday, and that's when they chose to strike. Egypt attacked the south of Israel from the Sinai Peninsula, and then Syria invaded from the north. That battle that happened on the north, it took place in several locations, but the big one was a place called the Golan Heights, which is also known as the Valley of Tears. And that battle was one of the largest conventional warfare battles ever since World War II. Syria sent around about 1,200 tanks against the Israeli line, and Israeli was heavily outnumbered. Israel used textbook defensive strategies and uh, they heavily employed anti-tank ditches and various other countermeasures against tanks. Ultimately, Syria was not able to successfully get past their defensive line, but uh, this tank was present for that battle on the Syrian side. Wow, that's impressive. I mean, proper employment of tank obstacles yeah. is, is paramount if you're gonna create a defense against them for yeah. sure, especially if you're outnumbered by yeah, oh yeah. 1,200 tanks. So uh, quickly, for those of you not so versed in armored warfare, that whole northern line of Israel where the, the Valley of the Tears is, an anti-tank ditch is a ditch that is dug very deep and so wide that a tank cannot cross over it. They uh, create a choke point uh, where it is convenient for the enemy tanks to cross that ditch or the enemy tank or tank unit will have the bridge laying equipment. Uh, the Israeli tanks were dug in, so they were in the, the turret up position, meaning the hull of the tank was actually below earth. And then those guns were pre-zeroed into those choke points on the anti-tank ditch. So uh, that first tank that crosses the choke point, if you knock that tank out and block the choke point, the tanks behind it are just sitting waiting. Take out the rest of the company. So that's, uh, uh, you know, that's loosely how that yeah. battle took place. That is absolutely textbook employment of, of a tank obstacle, tank ditch, things like that. Um, essentially what happens is when you attempt to drive over it, if you don't go fast enough, your barrel will stick into the ground and you'll either bend it, break it, stuff things in there, which could potentially blow up on your crew. Um, you could. I mean, even if you max elevate your gun barrel, you could get the, the uh, front slope of the tank stuck, uh, you get the front track, things like that. And then obviously if you get the, anim the, the enemy canalized into one spot, you can just rain hell on him and destroy a full company with just a platoon of tanks. At a distance through a tank telescope where there might be dust and smoke and a convoy, it is actually quite difficult to tell the difference between T-62 and T-55. The subtle differences are where the bore evacuator is located, uh, the general shape of the turret. If that vehicle's at a distance and moving, it's, it's very difficult to spot a T-62 from a T-55. For that reason, the Israelis were fearful of this, this main gun. Early on, the T-62s were the more sort of elite crew for the Syrians. Um, they were actually held in reserve and they sent in the T-55, T-54 first. But ultimately, as the battle progressed, these went straight in as well. It's interesting to note some sources I have read uh, stated that the Syrians, when they deployed in that area, they were all told it was going to just be a training exercise. 
and it wasn't until the day before or the morning of that they were told they were going to invade Israel. That is a good fact on um, maybe perhaps morale and preparedness. Even though they had a superior tank force, that fact alone, uh, the, the, there are stories of uh, tank crews just abandoning the tank and running back to the Syrian line. Wow. So um, whether there's uh, much truth to that, I'm not too sure. When this tank came to us, a lot of these markings were still here. Normally, uh, during a restoration, you would sandblast, sand down or needle scale the paint and go back to bare metal and do your restoration. But these original markings were such key indicators as to what this tank is and the story behind it. We essentially changed the plan a little bit. Before we did the paint job of the tank, which it did need a paint job, it was pretty rough. We went over all the markings first and we filled in the gaps where they had faded out and chipped away. And then we covered up the markings to do the paint job next. You have the Syrian army serial number right down here. And then this Arabic inscription here says the army or army. This box here is basically the divisional marking. Interesting with this tank is it didn't end in the Yom Kippur war. This tank survived that conflict. It then went on into a uh, fight in Lebanon in 1982. This tank has seen two conflicts yeah. and the Israelis captured this tank in Lebanon in 82. In between the Yom Kippur War and the Lebanese conflict, the Syrians changed all their markings. The markings you see on this tank right now are for the Lebanese conflict, but we know it was in Yom Kippur War because we found the old faded markings from the Yom Kippur War. The current configuration is what it would have had in Lebanon. The Israelis are known for being incredibly resourceful and making adaptions. They had a program where they would get captured T-55s, T-62s and convert them into what's called the Tehran tank. When the Israelis went out onto the battlefield, almost immediately they sent census teams and they actually marked each tank with a serial number and uh, the, the grid square of where it was knocked out and then pilots and such would get a back brief of the tank they shot in that area. Then when the tank went from the battlefield into scrap yards or storage areas they then added a more uh, professional looking sort of serial number if you will. Uh, we'll move around the side and I'll show you some other markings. So on the side of the turret here this uh, this V09 that is uh, Arabic numerals when they were in Lebanon. That was their call sign. Tanks in the Yom Kippur War, they never began with the V call sign. That's one indicator that this was in the Lebanese conflict. But this red writing that you see here, that's actually Hebrew. This is like a notification that this tank is suitable to be converted into a Tehran. So this was actually marked for the conversion. At that time, with Macabre and such coming out, there was no need to continue on with the Tehran conversion. Can you explain to the audience real quick what goes on in that conversion? There's a whole series of Tehran tanks, um, ranging from Tehran 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. The most common is from the T-55, T-54, and they removed the 100mm gun, and they actually installed the US 105mm oh. rifle gun. Okay. And they added, uh, I know the radio equipment was removed and they put in a US uh, radio equipment and then they changed a lot of the mounts to take US guns. Got it. So a good reference point of this for all you tank fans out there, the movie The Beast, those tanks in that film are actually to run. Oh cool. So if you study right. The Beast again closely and you look at the barrel, so T-55, the bore evacuator is right at the front of the barrel. But the L7 gun, the bore evacuator is right down, halfway down the barrel. Got it. And then you know in that film they have like an M250 cal on top. Uh, that's because the, the mounts were for a 50 cal. And uh, the Russian 12.7 gun was, at that time when they made that movie, probably just not widely available. It's uh, about as much as I know about the T-Run conversions. More than I knew. Well, let's talk about the track, that's kind of cool. Okay, yeah. So this is the early style of track for the T-Tanks. Um, it's a very similar concept to the T-34 World War II track. There was an upgrade to this track, but uh, this track in particular, like a lot of uh, modernized track that features rubber bushings inside, this is all metal to metal and there are no nuts and bolts or end connectors. It is literally just a pin and a track. 
and it's unique because there's no head to the pin on the outside here but there is a head on the pin on the inside as a lot of you would know uh metal to metal creates friction and it makes these track pins actually walk back out of the track if you come down here you can see what is referred to as the pin hammer so this raised piece of metal off the hull every time the track passes over this this raised piece of metal smashes the pin back into place so each rotation those pins will begin to walk back out some do some don't uh, but by the time they pass that they just get smashed back in again it makes a very very unique sound so t34 and early t55 and 62 when you're driving it you can hear on the hull you can hear the pins getting smashed into place I think that's a super low-tech way to, to make sure that your track stays on. If you think about it, uh, if you go to the upgraded style, they still had a pin, but there was ru rubber bushings in between uh, each track link. Then the pin had bolts on either end. So you're introducing a more complicated manufacturing process. Right, so there's, a, there's actually less parts to break as a result of this design. Right, so because it is metal to metal, uh, this would wear down much quicker. This tank has plenty of miles on it and the track is still fine. Are we going up top? Yeah. Okay, let's go up top. 